All right, so the title of this chapter is Energy, Enzymes, and Biological Reactions. And you're going to be surprised with how much of this you probably already know. Again, I'm just putting it at a collegiate level and integrating that terminology so that you can successfully answer test questions. But do you remember what energy is? ATP. ATP. So we're going to spend a lot of time on ATP in this chapter. Okay? Enzymes, we've mentioned one time. Do you remember what biomolecule enzymes are? Proteins. Proteins. Fantastic. So the reason why I do this chapter next is because enzymes are a type of biomolecule. They're a protein. So we just finished biomolecule, so it makes sense to do enzymes next because it branches off of that. And then what about this, biological reactions? You already know what those are too. What are biological reactions? Like 100% metabolism. That's truly what it is, 100% metabolism. So if you'll get out your metabolism diagram, we're going we're gonna to start adding to that. Actually, we're going to fill that up today. You're gonna, it's going to be a lot of metabolism. But I want to start, before we go to our notes, I want to start with what we already have on metabolism. So what do we already have for metabolism? Fantastic. We can start off with anabolic and catabolic. What does catabolic mean? It breaks down. Fantastic. I have a quick question to divert just a moment. How many of you wrote this on your answer document and used it during the exam? How many of you found it beneficial? I'm telling you, it, it'll keep you on track. It'll keep you on track. Okay, what does anabolic mean? Build up. Fantastic. Okay, let's, let's go to catabolic right now and focus on what we have catabolically. What else do we have to describe catabolic? Hydrolysis. Yes. And do you remember what hydrolysis means? We're going to add water. Yes. Add H2O. Um, do we have anything else here? Okay, for um, catabolic. Okay, um, we we could take it that way, and it could start, we hydro like okay. I want to put that because that's not always true, but we have polar and nonpolar. Did we did discuss that? Um, what about whenever things go through a catabolic reaction? Am I creating monomers or polymers? Why does it make sense it's monomers and not polymers? What does mono mean? One. And how far do you, can you break it down until it's just one? So catabolic reactions, we're trying to break them down into monomers. And so that means it's just one. That should be basically what we have for catabolic. What about anabolic? Dehydrate. Synthesis, yes. Dehydration. Synthesis. What else? Condensation. Fantastic. Are we adding water or taking water away? Right, we are removing water. Um... Are we creating monomers or polymers? Polymers, right, which means, and poly, of course, means many. And we build up to that, okay? So we are going to add quite a bit to this today, but I wanted to have what we already have so we know where we're starting from. Fantastic job. All right, so... Why even study all of this stuff? And I don't normally do feature stories, but I do want you to be knowledgeable on this topic because quite a few people aren't. This itself is not a Venus flytrap, but it's a plant very similar to a Venus flytrap. And there's a lot of confusion as to how Venus flytraps function. People think that as soon as the fly lands on the leaf, which is the flytrap part, that that flytrap just snaps closed. People also believe that if they put their finger on that leaf, that it's going like, to get them. Is that, is that what happens? No. 
plants move. Is that fly trap going to close? Yes, but it closes very... So how does a very slow closing trap keep something like a fly that's super fast? It's sticky. It secretes enzymes. So truly the way it works is that leaf, which is that fly trap, has hairs that stick up, that function as trigger pins, like perhaps mines in a minefield. And when that fly lands, it moves the hairs. And immediately that leaf secretes enzymes that cause that fly to do what? Get stuck. And as that fly tries to get loose, what does it do? It's trying to move, so what does it do to those hairs? Yeah, it gets more and more sticky. Those hairs move as it's trying to fight its way out, and so more enzymes are released, and as that, so that fly is just landed on like a mouse trap, one of those sticky mouse traps, and it's not going anywhere. So it's trying to fight its way, more enzymes are, are being secreted, and that leaf is slowly closing. Those enzymes function just like our stomach acid. That leaf is truly digesting that fly while it's alive. And so it's releasing these enzymes that are breaking that fly down and they're gonna melt into that leaf and that leaf will absorb it. But do you remember what carbohydrate every insect has in their exoskeleton? Chitin, it starts with a C. So the plant can't break down the chitin. So the plant will digest all the insides of that organism, but it has to leave the skeleton, the carcass. So once it opens back up, the carcass will fall off, but all the insides and the actual fly mass is gone. So that's really cool if you think about it, but it happens really slowly, not like, oh, gotcha. And all of that is carried out by enzymes, which is one of the things that we're gonna focus on in this chapter. How long would you say? Um, so as for, for it, it to close anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can uh, YouTube it, there's quite a few videos that will show, show you that happening, yeah. If you're like, hey. Another thing I strongly suggest you YouTube, random side note, is how a starfish walks. Blow your mind. <laughs> I'm not even gonna tell you how. All right. You, I may be in there. A couple of things I wanted to point out. Life on Earth, it starts off, this whole chapter starts off with life on Earth could not have evolved without catalysts. And I have catalysts in blue. Any idea what a catalyst is? It is an enzyme, yes. Messenger. A messenger. What, could it, what does a catalyst do? In your friend group, you have a catalyst. So like if y'all are all hanging out, watching movies, there's one of you who's eventually going to get bored and say what? Can we go do something else? Does anybody want to go get something to eat? Or anybody want to go to the game? Like a catalyst is somebody who's like, let's do something. Let's get something started. A catalyst starts a reaction. Okay? So life on Earth could not have evolved without catalysts, something to start it. Most of those catalysts, are proteins, and specifically, they function as enzymes. And I wanted you to see that. This second bullet goes ahead and it defines enzymes academically. It says, enzymes speed up the rate of reactions by many millions of times without the need for an increase in temperature. So they increase the rate of reaction millions of times without a need for an increase in temperature. My simplified version of a definition of an enzyme is an enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction. An enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction. An enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction. Big picture, there are only two types of reactions. What are they? Catabolic or anabolic, so hydrolysis and dehydration is the same thing. We can use those terms, so you're not wrong for saying that. But an enzyme will either speed up the breakdown or speed up the buildup. That's it. Those are your only options. So if you keep that big picture in mind as you're reading through and analyzing things, it should come a little bit easier. Okay? It mentions here, 
Enzymes are essential in metabolism. Okay, we already know metabolism. And then it defines metabolism, the biochemical modification. What? Biochemical modification. Tell me what this is a fancy word for. The two types of reactions that occur. Metabolism. It is metabolism. What are the two types of? Catabolic. Catabolic or anabolic. So biochemical modification. I either break them down or I build them. That's what this means right here. Biochemically modified. They're either broken down or built up. And the use of organic molecules, you already know the organic molecules. What are the four organic molecules? Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. Fantastic. See, you already know this stuff. And energy, which is ATP, to support the activities of life. So one more time, enzymes are essential, so they speed up reactions in metabolism, which is the biochemical modification, so build up or break down and use of organic molecules like proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids, along with energy to support the activities of life. That's just a fancy academic way of saying, we're gonna break down your food and use it to create other things. So the first topic, so it was energy, enzymes, and biological reactions is the topic, or the title for this chapter. So we'll start with energy first. Energy is, by definition, the capacity to do work. It's the capacity to do work, which means you have the potential to do work, does, but does it mean that you're actually working? No. No. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're working, but by definition, energy is the capacity to work. There are multiple forms of energy. There's heat energy, light energy, chemical energy. There's a lot of energies. You and I are going to focus just on two, potential and kinetic. So we're going to keep it simple. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, so something moving. And potential energy is stored energy, something that's not moving. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Potential energy is stored energy. <clears throat> so in your textbook, it shows a a woman drawn back on a bow, and it says classify this type of energy. Potential or kinetic? Why is it potential? She's still. She's still. The energy is stored. But as soon as she looses that arrow, it goes from potential to kinetic, because that's the energy of motion. So can energy change forms from potential to kinetic? Yes, yes it can, okay? Um, my very first biology test, the question was, you have a piece of chocolate cake, what type of energy is it? I was like, of course I'm overanalyzing it. I'm like, chemical energy, it's gonna give me energy to do activities. No, it only gives you, it has the potential to give you energy, but the cake by itself is actually just potential. Any food by itself is just potential energy. It doesn't become chemical energy until you do what? eat it. I was like, dang it, and I got that answer wrong. So energy may be converted between potential and kinetic states. It mentions here an example, again, out of your book. It says, in plants, the radiant energy of the sunlight is transformed into chemical energy in the form of organic molecules. So plants get radiant energy from sun, and it's transformed into chemical energy in the form of organic molecule. What organic molecule does a plant make? What sugar? Somebody said it. it. Starts with a G. Glucose. Plants make glucose. They use light energy, radiant energy, to create glucose, which for the plant is chemical energy, but for us it's potential energy. When does it become chemical energy for us? After we consume it, right? Yes, yeah, so, so the energy is there. It's just changing forms. It's just changing forms. So here we have our metabolism uh, diagram. We're going to add to it just briefly. But um, this is in this chapter. And, of course, I've heavy taught metabolism, so we should be solid on most of it. But it defines metabolism as the sum of all chemical reactions in the body. I feel like you're solid with that. 
says that catabolic reactions break down molecules, but it has a new descriptor here. Catabolic reactions do what? They release energy. So when you break something down, you're releasing that energy. So I'm going to add it. They release energy when you break something down. Anabolic reactions, they don't release energy, they, they use energy. In order to build things, it's going to take energy. So I'm going to put that they use energy, that they use energy. Are you here to hear the lecture again, or do you want to be loud? Okay, that's totally fine. I just wanted to make sure that you, if you didn't want to go ahead and start building, but if you're doing lecture, I'm totally cool with that. I just didn't want to waste your time. Awesome. Okay, good deal. So um, I wanted to add those to our metabolism circle. We're going to come back to it, but for right now. All right, so uh, we, should, we should be good. Our metabolism diagram is growing continuously. So then we go to the topic of thermodynamics. First thing I want to point out, the definition, thermodynamics. It's the study of energy flow between a system and its surrounding chemical and physical reactions. Chemical and physical reactions. Are chemical and physical reactions living reactions? They're not. Chemical reactions, they occur in living organisms, but do, does it have to be a living organism that they occur in? No. So are physical reactions requiring something to be living? No, these are not, they don't necessarily have to take place with a living organism, okay? I would know that they were occurring in a living organism, perhaps if it said like biological reactions, all right? It defines the two types of systems that, um, are classified as far as thermodynamics is concerned. We have a closed system and an open system. And I have the terms defined here, but I have a diagram to kind of to represent or depict what's occurring. In a closed system, that system only exchanges energy with its surroundings. Only exchanges energy with its surroundings. In an open system, that organism or that system, whatever it is in that system, exchanges both energy and matter. Energy and matter. You and I, as well as every other living organism, we are all considered open systems. We are all considered open systems. Closed systems are really just going to be non-living things or perhaps even a lab-controlled experiment. You could do a closed system in a lab, but it doesn't necessarily have to be living. Or, I mean, most of the time, actually, it's not. Okay? So open versus closed systems. Continuing with thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics, and you've already heard both of these laws of thermodynamics that I'm about to teach you. You just didn't know that you've heard them, and many of you already do know you've heard them. First law of thermodynamics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can change forms or be transformed. Yes. So you've probably heard someone say, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can't. The total amount of energy on Earth will never change. It cannot change. But the types of energy can change. We cannot make energy and we cannot get rid of energy. But the energy can change forms. It can go from being radiant to chemical to potential to kinetic. It, it can change forms. But the amount of it, we, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So you can't make new energy. Okay? This gives you an example using the sun. sun and Volvox. This is um, what you looked at under the microscope last week when you did your microscope assessment. Ours was dyed red, but this is the organism. It's an algae. Um, the sun gives radiant energy to photosynthetic organisms, and those photosynthetic organisms 
create organic molecules. And what organic molecules do photosynthetic organisms create? I just asked you this a moment ago. Glucose. Okay, the organic molecules means it has to have carbon. So glucose would be the only option there. Oxygen is a waste product. It's a gas, but it's inorganic because it does not include carbon. Fantastic. Okay. Um, does anybody know how much energy you get from your food? Somebody said, yeah, 10%. It is 10%. Um, so let's say, for example, in our food chain, we start with a plant. And where does that plant get its energy from? The sun. So we'll... So we have the sun here, and let's say the sun gives it one million joules of energy. That's how much energy is coming from the sun. A plant's only going to get 10% of that that it can actually use. So how much energy does the plant get? What's 10% of a million? It's 100,000. You literally just drop a zero. Okay? Then what happens to the plant? It gets eaten by what? Cow. Random that the last class said cow too. You guys must all think the same. So let's say it gets eaten by a cow. How much energy does that cow get? 10%, which would be 10,000. What happens to the cow? Okay, you said by human, okay? The last class said wolf or human. Like, okay, cool. So um, we'll say human. And how much energy does that human get? A thousand. Do you see what's happening here? What's going to eat the human? Fungus or a bacteria. Yes. Fungi. And that rule continues. But if this only gets 10%, where did the other 90% go? It got released as heat. 90% gets released as heat. 90% is released as heat. Where does all that heat go? It goes back into the air, into the atmosphere, where it gets trapped, which is what that movie Wally was about, just so you know. All the pollution got trapped in the atmosphere, and what did it block from getting to the earth? The sun. And if there's no sun to the earth, tell me what else is impacted. What, how is life? When you say you're right with life, but how? How is oxygen impacted by sun? If there's no sun, there's no plants. There's no plants, there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen, there's no... Us, there's no life. And so because there was so much pollution, the sun couldn't get through, there was no plant life, there was no oxygen, they had to go to outer space and live with their bottled oxygen. And that little robot Eve, what was her job? She came down to Earth to find signs of life. And she found a plant, took it back up there, and when there was a plant back on Earth, what did they have evidence of? That the sun was getting through and life could now be sustained back on Earth whole movie was about that. My kids didn't get it at all. They were like, what? But I also took them when they were like six and four, and they were like, there's no talking in this movie. But if you, like, that's what the whole thing, that's what the whole movie is based on. So all of that heat is captured in our atmosphere, which leads us to the second law of thermodynamics, which, wrong mouse. Second law of thermodynamics that says... The total disorder or entropy will always increase. The total disorder or entropy, which is our academic word for disorder, will always increase. Because we continue to add heat, things get more and more chaotic. Because we continue to add heat, things get more and more chaotic. When you add
heat to a pot of water, what do the molecules do inside that pot? They start to jump around, and then they'll form bubbles, and eventually they'll get so hot, they'll begin to evaporate. Those, those molecules are just everywhere. Everywhere. When you add heat, things get chaotic. What do we continue to add to our atmosphere? Heat. We're doing it right now. Adding heat. So the amount of disorder or chaos is always going to increase. This diagram shows everything being ordered and condensed and everything has its place, but we add heat and it increases entropy, the amount of disorder. And the more heat you add, the more disorder there is. The total amount of energy will never change. Total amount of energy will never change, but it can continue to transform into different types of energy. Does that make sense? So the two laws of thermodynamics, it cannot be created nor destroyed, and the amount of disorder will always increase. Questions? Okay. Spontaneous reactions. When you hear the term spontaneous, what do you think of? Like random, all of a sudden. Does that apply to life? Is life spontaneous? Could a tree just pop up right here? No. No, no, I couldn't just plant. I mean, if I did all the work, I could potentially get a plant to grow here. But could I just expect one to show up? No. Like shoot through the floor? The answer is no. When a woman becomes pregnant, are we confused as to what happened? No, we know it wasn't spontaneous. Something, there was work put into that. Somebody planted this tree. Somebody had a baby. Okay, it's not spontaneous. Life is not spontaneous. Okay? So we have some terms here that I want to use to fill in more of our metabolic uh, or metabolism diagram. But I want to discuss them before I add them. So spontaneous, we had a whole bunch of energy, and I can see that here. There's a bunch of energy here. But as this reaction takes place, what happens to the amount of energy in that system? It decreases. So where is that energy going? If it's, if it's decreasing, it has to be going somewhere. Back to the, it's being released. So if it's not within that system, that energy is being released. So we had a bunch of it, and as the reaction carried out, the amount of energy decreased. It's because it released it. Spontaneous reactions release energy. So are they catabolic or anabolic? How, do you see how you can put those terms together and you're like, okay, I get this. I can figure out how this all goes. It's just a puzzle. It releases energy, so spontaneous reactions are catabolic. Another term to describe this same reaction would be exothermic or exergonic. And we can also represent spontaneous exothermic exergonic reactions with the negative delta G. So I'm actually going to put all of these terms, spontaneous, exothermic, exergonic, and negative delta G on my catabolic side. But I want to stay on this before I move the camera over there. What's the opposite of spontaneous? <laughs> literally, yes, literally the book uses not spontaneous. So I'm, gonna, I'm good with that. Some people have said like controlled, okay? But not spontaneous is what the text uses, and it's the exact opposite. I have no energy, but as I carry out this reaction, the amount of energy I have increases in my system. So I'm using energy. I am not releasing energy. So what type of reaction is this? Anabolic. These non-spontaneous reactions are also referred to as endergonic, endothermic, and they're represented by a positive delta G. And again, I'll come back to these delta Gs in just a moment, but I'm going to go fill in my diagram over here. 
of terms that we need to associate. So let's use green. Oh, I just used green. Blue. Oh, I used blue over here. Dang it. All right. Anyways, um, these are spontaneous. They could be called exothermic or exergonic. And they're represented by a negative delta G. These are not spontaneous. These are referenced as endergonic or endothermic and represented by a positive delta G by positive delta G. Okay, again, we're just talking about these chemical reactions and how energy is being transferred in forms. Okay? So that's the topic that we're on so far, energy. This next slide has the equation for free energy, the equation for free energy. It's red, and some of you may already know what we call that triangle. It's referenced as delta, but it means change. So you would read this, delta G is equal to delta H minus T times delta S. You will never have to calculate anything with this equation, but you will need to recognize it, so you'll need to memorize it, and you need to know what each letter represents. You need to recognize it, and you need to know what each letter represents. And then I'll also show you how to interpret it in just a moment. So if we know that that triangle is a delta, so delta, and delta means change, G is free energy. So delta G is the change in free energy. H is total energy. So delta H is change in total energy. T is the absolute temperature in degrees Kelvin. And then S is entropy, and delta S is the change in entropy. So that's how you would read that. How to interpret this. How to interpret this. If you had a test question that was asking you about this, as far as interpretation is concerned, it would give you a long story, not necessarily long, but it would probably be a couple sentences. You had this much energy here, this much energy was used, this much energy was released. Ultimately, through the series of these reactions, you have a net delta G that is equal to negative 3.78. What type of reaction is it if your net delta G is negative 3.78? Catabolic. If it has a negative delta G, it's catabolic. But it could be any of these terms. You might call it exergonic, endergon or exergonic exothermic. Any of those terms would work. Another example would be you have this series of reactions, and it's got 28 here and 34 here and so on and so on. But at the end it says your delta G has a net value of 14.3. What type of reaction is this? It's, yeah, anabolic, endergonic, endothermic, something like that because it's a positive delta G. So, you recognize the equation, you understand what the variables represent, and you can interpret the answers. So if delta G is negative, you know it's one thing, and if it's positive, you know it's the other. You only have two types of reactions. They're either catabolic or anabolic. We just have a lot of different terms we can use to refer to them. Anybody have a question right now? Okay. ATP. What is ATP again? 
energy, fantastic, which is still a topic that we're on. Um, does anybody remember what biomolecule ATP is? It's a nucleic acid. It is a nucleic acid. It falls in with DNA and RNA. ATP is a nucleic acid. Okay? What does ATP do? It gives us energy. But what does AT, why do we call it ATP? We have our sugar here, we have our adenine, and we have three phosphates. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. We call it ATP because it has three phosphates. Okay, so this is ATP. ATP is created in your body all the time. You use quadrillions and zillions and whatever bigger number there is than that of ATP molecules every single day. But you, your body gives you a certain amount of ATP daily based on what your routine is. So your body pretty much says, I know that Jessica is going to do this same thing every day, so I'm going to make sure she has enough ATP to get through it. And that's why normally, in a normal day, if I do what I normally do, I don't get tired as easily. Okay? So my body knows I wake up at 3.50 in the morning. It knows that I work out and I do all this stuff, and then I teach, and then I go pick up my kids, I go to games and practices, and I usually get to bed around 11.30, and I do the same thing all over again. My body knows that. Did I immediately have that routine, and was I not tired? It took me a long time to be able to handle that amount of work and not be tired. My body learned to accommodate what I'm doing. If I change my lifestyle, I will change the amount of ATP I have. For example, let's say that I didn't do all that. Let's say that I just woke up and came to work. My body says, you only need 1,000 molecules of ATP, and I'm using a small number because it's easier to explain. 1,000 molecules of ATP every day. Okay, but let's just say that all of a sudden I decided I want to work out this afternoon. My body only gave me 1,000. I'm going to run a mile. So I'm going to run a mile. And let's say I've already burned my 1,000 molecules of ATP. Is my body going to stop? No, your body has this incredible ability to produce ATP on demand. So if I do something that I don't normally do, my body will accommodate. It'll make more energy like this. But how am I going to feel? Tired. It is going to make me tired because I had to do a lot of work to produce that energy, and I just ran. So I'm going to go home, and I'm going to be tired, and my body's going to say tonight when it's recharging me, it's going to say, she used 1,200 today. I'm not going to give her 1,200 because she's probably not going to do that same thing tomorrow. She's not going to do a crazy thing twice in a row. So I'll give her 1,010 molecules of ATP. So she has a little bit of extra energy. So the next day, when I wake up, how do my muscles feel? Sore. And so what's the last thing I want to do? What's the thing I should do? Work out. Yeah, that's the only thing that's going to take that soreness away. And some of you are like, I know, but I still don't do it. <laughs> so let's say part of my routine is I'm going to make myself run this mile again. So I do it. I have 1,010 molecules, but I burn 1,200. How do I feel at the end of that mile? Tired. Again, I had to produce that ATP on demand. But when I go to bed tonight, my body's going to be tired, and it's going to say, you know what? She got crazy twice in a row. I'm not going to give her 1,010, now I'll give her 1,040. So it slowly starts to increase the amount of ATP that it provides for me. Within 14 days of doing the exact same activity, I will have provided my body enough ATP to get through that one mile without feeling tired. So when you start a new workout routine, at first it's really hard because you don't have the ATP, but as you start to do it, your body will provide that ATP over time and it becomes easier and easier and easier. When that workout is easy, what's the next step? Increase it, increase the intensity. Require your body to use more and more ATP and you'll have it. Then let's say I get to the point where I'm like, oh, I like the way my abs look and my thighs are exactly where I want them. What do a lot of people do? Stop. So I've provided myself all this ATP and it's taken me months to build it up. You roughly increase your ATP levels one to two percent each time. It takes a long time to increase your ATP levels. Guess how fast you lose ATP? Fifteen percent for each workout you miss. 
15. What? I just wanted a break, and breaks are healthy because it keeps your muscles guessing and all, and you need that. But if you go three weeks without working out, when you start back again, guess where you're starting from? 1,000 molecules of ATP. And you'll have to build yourself up again. But it's much easier for your body because you're mentally already aware of the situation than the first time. So that's how ATP works. But how do I get energy from ATP? You already know the answer to this. I have to break a bond. When I have to break a bond, guess what I have to do? It's catabolic. I add water. In order to get energy from ATP, I hydrolyze it. In order to get energy from ATP, I hydrolyze it. I add one molecule of water and I break the bond between the two phosphates. And the amount of energy that that one reaction gives me is analogous with the spark from a lightning bug. That little bit of light that you see emitted from a lightning bug is the amount of energy you get from the hydrolysis of one molecule of ATP. Like just a spark. So how many sparks do you and I need? Like a bunch of sparks, okay? We're sparky people. So we add water, we get our spark. This goes from being ATP to, why is it DP? Diphosphate, yes, diphosphate. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, phos triphosphate to diphosphate. So I went from three to two, and I added water and broke that bond, and it released that energy. Your body will recycle because your body is not trying to have to create new things all the time. Your body will take this, and it will make it ATP again. How do I make it ATP again? I have to create a bond. I have to dehydrate it. So I will dehydrate it and put these back together and get my ATP. But let me tell you that there's a special word we use for the dehydration of ATP. Phosphorylation, yes. Phosphorylation. So is this anabolic or catabolic if I'm dehydrating? Anabolic. anabolic. So the term, and this is the last term to add today, is phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is the dehydration of ADP and turning it into ATP. It only applies to ATP. You won't use it on another topic. So when you see phosphorylation, you know we're talking about ATP. We're talking about ATP. So phosphorylation. And I have that here. Okay, so hydrolysis will release that energy, so it breaks a bond. Phosphorylation is the reaction that occurs when you add that phosphate back. So that's the dehydration. We specifically call it phosphorylation. Dang it. So here's that cycle, ADP to ATP. And this is probably not going to surprise you. But you get energy, like let's say from your food. You break it down and it provides you energy for your body. And then your body uses that energy to carry out activities. And what happens to your energy levels? They decrease. So what do you have to do? I have to restore them by getting more energy from my food or for whatever source I get it from. I will change it from that food source to me. Then I will use this energy to carry out my activities. And then I'll be low on energy. And guess what I'm going to have to do? Like, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. ATP to ADP. And you'll do this. One molecule of ATP can do this thousands of times. And when it stops being effective, guess what your body does to it? Gets rid of it. It breaks it down and you pee it out. You don't even know. You're like, my pee is full of energy? It is. You have energetic urine. It's also full of a lot of other waste as well. So don't, like it's not an energy drink or anything like that. Okay, no. Here's an example of a... Um, of a process that requires ATP. It's also a diagram that you will see again. But I have my phospholipid bilayer with my integrated proteins, which we'll talk about in a future chapter for this test. But I'm moving molecules from inside the cell to outside. How do I know they're moving in that direction? 
the arrow clearly indicates that to me. Does this process require energy? How do you know it requires energy? There's an ATP right here. The ATP always looks like this, too. Like in all of your biology books, it'll always look like this. On your test, it'll look like this. So if you see this, you know that this process requires energy. If it's not there, guess what? It doesn't require energy. That's a very safe assumption. Okay? And clearly the title says cellular events driven by ATP hydrolysis. Cellular events, I know this is the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, driven by ATP hydrolysis. I took ATP, I added water, and created ADP. So hydrolysis of that. This diagram right here, I wanted, and I explained it, but we're talking about equilibrium. So am I talking about non-living systems or living systems when I talk about equilibrium? Non-living systems, okay? If it's living, what word do we use again? Homeostasis, yes, for balance, okay? When we talk about equilibrium, though, we're often talking about solutions, okay, or chemical equations that may occur, chemical reactions that may occur in living organisms, but if we're talking about equilibrium, the system we're referencing is not living, okay? What we have here, and I'm going to, hopefully you start to catch the pattern. We have a system where I have a whole bunch of blue, and then I have a thick blue arrow. This is indicating to me what needs to occur in order to reach equilibrium. Tell me what needs to occur to reach equilibrium in that first system. The blue molecules need to move over to the other side. Do you think it's a lot or a little of blue molecules? A lot, and that is indicated to us or depicted to us because that that arrow is pretty big. It's saying that a lot of these molecules are going to have to move to the right. Okay? And this second system, or, or solution, however you want to say it, I have blue over here in a medium sized, red over here in a tiny sized. Explain to me what needs to occur to reach equilibrium, please. I need a little bit of red to move from right to left. And how do I know just a little bit? really thin. And then I need a few more to move from left to right of blue. Do you see how to interpret that? What about that third one? What can you tell me? It's balanced and they're moving in those directions at an equal amount, right? And then you have the reverse of the previous two here. In this case, I have more red moving than blue, but it's in order for me to reach, yeah, reach equilibrium. And in, in this one, I have a whole bunch of red that needs to move to reach equilibrium. Everybody okay with that and how to interpret it? Okay, enzymes. The big or the, the major topic for the rest of this chapter. I have here a bunch of specific information that will help you all throughout enzymes. First of all, I have my definition of enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. There are only two types of reactions that they can speed up. Catabolic or anabolic. They can either speed up the breakdown of something or they can speed up the buildup or the creation of something. That is the only two options. Or those are the only two options. Okay? I also have here that enzymes not always but many times end with ASE. So like the name of the enzyme might be lactase or maltase or amylase or acetylcholesterase. Like they end in that ASE, so that indicates to me right then I'm dealing with an enzyme. So they're usually pretty easy to identify, but that's not always the case. They're just usually, okay? As far as characteristics of enzymes, the first is that enzymes are very specific. If their job, I'm going to use this one right here. So lactose is broken down by the enzyme lactase. Do you see how they're, like you can usually identify also how that works. So lactose and lactase, maltose, maltase, amylose, amylase, 
acetylcholine, acetylcholesterase. Like it, not always, but many times it's like that. Okay? They're very specific. So if I'm lactase, I'm the enzyme that breaks down the sugar in milk. What if salt shows up? What do I do? Just like, what? They're like, hey, I need some help. I only know how to work with milk sugar. Like, I don't know. Well, you're an enzyme. Can you help me out? No. Like, I'm specific. I can only function with lactose. That's it. They're very specific. There's no, hey, I can help you out here. Nope. That's not a thing. If you're lactose intolerant, guess what enzyme you're lacking? Lactase, 100%. If you have another enzyme, let's say, for example, maltase, which would, but anyway, you have that, can maltase break down lactose? No, they're specific, okay? Can you tell me what determines their specificity? Yes, shape. Yes, their shape determines their function. So we know, first of all, that enzymes are very specific. The second thing, and we've already discussed, but enzymes function as catalysts. And by definition, a catalyst means that it gets a reaction going. So it stimulates or, or, or initiates a reaction. The third characteristic is that enzymes function to lower activation energy. They function to lower activation energy. What does that mean? That means that enzymes will decrease the amount of work needed to get a job done. Enzymes will decrease the amount of work needed to get a job done. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I say I weigh 500 pounds and my goal is to weigh 100 pounds. Can I lose that much weight on my own? Okay, fantastic. Over a long period of time, yes, I can. Tell me what I'm going to need to do. I might need to work out. I'm going to have to eat better. I'm, I'm probably going to have to overhaul my entire lifestyle, true or false. And it's going to require a stupid amount of discipline. Okay? I'm going to have to have some type of accountability. And, and Ashley said, it's going to take a really long time. Give me a time frame. I would say two to three years, yeah. I would say two to three years. But could I do that? Could I get to that weight? The answer is yes, I could. It's going to take a lot of work, but I can get there. Now, what if, and this is not a real thing, okay, but just saying, what if there was a diet pill that could get me from 500 to 100 and I didn't have to change my lifestyle? It lost the weight for me. It lowers my activation energy. So do I still get to 100? Yes. Do I get there faster? Does it decrease the amount of work I have to do? That's what an enzyme does. Okay? Now, just so that we're on the same page, number one, there's no diet pill that does that. Okay? Number two, if there were, you would probably have a ridiculous amount of diarrhea and you would be sweating while you're just sitting down because your metabolic rate would be so high. And probably what would your heart be doing while you're just sitting doing nothing? And you could probably just have a heart attack sitting there. So it's not a thing. There's no diet pill that does that. Do not take diet pills. I am not saying that. I'm just trying to use that to help you understand the concept. Okay? So a diet pill would function to get me to the end without having to do all the work. And that's exactly what an enzyme does. An enzyme speeds up that reaction rate and it gets me there with less work on my part. In this case, here's 500, here's 100. Here's me doing it naturally, a whole bunch of work. Here's me doing it with an enzyme or a diet pill, a whole lot less work and I get to the exact same outcome and faster. Okay, so an enzyme is a protein that speeds up a reaction and they so they're a catalyst, they initiate, they're specific, they only work with certain things, and they lower activation energy. They lower, decrease the amount of work necessary to reach that outcome or that product. Questions? <clears throat> Here it talks about the, um, it covers a couple of things on this slide. The first 
is how an enzyme actually functions. So here is representing the enzyme, and I have it clearly labeled. This piece right in here, or this little pocket, is called the active site. The active site has a specific shape. Why? Yeah, it's going to fit with whatever it, it, it works with, okay? It has a specific shape because it has a specific function. So here, previously, we've called what goes into a reaction a reactant. These are the reactants, but when we talk about enzymes, we call them substrates, okay? So they're the exact same thing. It's just that it, I'm, I'm talking about an enzyme right now. So substrates, what's going in? And if these substrates fit into this active site, if they fit correctly, this enzyme will very quickly squeeze it. I call it an enzyme hug. It just does that. Within that split squeeze, which is less than a second, it creates or destroys a bond. It either dehydrates or it hydrolyzes. That one squeeze. So in this case, where I came in with two, they obviously fit. I got my little squeeze, so we call this the induced fit, because they fit together. What type of reaction did this enzyme carry out? How do you know it was a dehydration reaction? I went from two to one. So I know this is a dehydration reaction. Let's just say... Hypothetically, it went this direction. So I came in with one, and I left with two. Hydrolysis reaction. There's only two types of reactions. You either create them or you break them down. Okay, and you can use any of our words to fit in there. Once this enzyme carries out this reaction, and it's finished and it releases the product, what's this enzyme going to do next? It moves on to the next one. It does. So, like, for example, I have to teach you biology. I teach you biology. I teach you. Like, you just keep going. You keep going. You keep going. You keep going. They do the exact same thing over and over and over again. If you're a lactase molecule, you break down lactose. You break down lactose. You break down lactose. You don't just have billions and billions of lactase. You have maybe 100,000, let's say and they're responsible for breaking down five, 5 million molecules of lactose, so they have to do it over and over again, okay? So a couple of comments on this diagram and on this situation. The active site will combine briefly with the substrate, so if the substrate fits, they'll fit together and the enzyme will hug it. We reference that as the induced fit, okay? Induced fit, meaning they fit together. The products are released. The products have either been dehydrated or hydrolyzed. They've either been brought together or they've been separated. And once that enzyme is finished, it goes back and does the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> Everybody okay with that? So here I have my enzyme. I have my active site. I have my substrate up at the top. That substrate fits into that active site. And here, am I going to dehydrate it or hydrolyze it? How do you know I'm hydrolyzing? How do you know I'm adding water? It's clearly H2O. That arrow is showing you that it's being included. And what has happened to this bond? It broke. So is this a catabolic or anabolic reaction? Catabolic. Was it dehydration or hydrolysis? What's that enzyme going to do next? Start all over again. Okay? You're going to do that over and over again. When I taught you proteins last week, I said, if you change the shape of a protein, you change its function. Do you recall some ways? First of all, what was the word I used whenever I said change the shape of a protein? Denatured. It started with a D. Denatured. Denatured means I changed that shape. So, of course, I changed its function. Do you recall some methods which would lead to a change in protein structure? 
heat and sterilization, salt, okay, pH, whether there's a, it's really acidic or really basic, we talked about all of those, okay? In this case, when we talk about uh, conditions that inside an individual, an organism that will impact how well a enzyme functions, we talk about body temperature, and we talk about pH. Your enzymes are going to function best at what body temperature? Yeah, how we feel, okay? How we feel. So 98.6 is our homeostatic body temperature. Our enzymes are on it. Of course, it's saying 37 degrees south, but I'm talking about Fahrenheit. What about pH? Do we, what's the pH of us? Is it acidic or basic? It's, it's very close to neutral. So our enzymes want to do what? Function in what type of environment? A neutral type of environment. So if I change that, I potentially could change the shape of my proteins and therefore change their function. Let me give you an example of what we mean by they work in a really small range. Okay. We in Texas a long time, not a long time ago, this is while I was teaching. I'm still teaching. Whatever. Anyway, we said... Students are falling asleep in class. Classrooms are too warm. And, and that was a case. Students were falling asleep. So we think if we make the classrooms really cold, students are going to stay up and alert and pay attention during class. Okay? And initially, that did work. And by initially, I mean very short term. Because what did we notice students started doing? Sweaters. Bringing sweaters and jackets. And then when I said, not necessarily me, but when we said, hey, that doesn't fit into the dress code. They stopped bringing the jackets and sweaters and started bringing... They were wearing long sleeves. They were wearing blank, bringing blankets. And I know if you've been in high school recently, you know what I'm talking about, because students will walk through the hallways with blankets. And then it went from blankets to blankets with pillows. Like, did you come to come to school? Or, like, and I'm not kidding, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Hopefully that wasn't you. But we realized when we kept the classroom too cold, it was uncomfortable for students. And it wasn't in their range of comfort, so they didn't focus on their schoolwork. What did they focus on? They, were, they wanted to get warm. They were too cold. And then if it's cold and I have myself all bundled up, what do I have the tendency to do? Fall asleep. So we collect a whole bunch of data. We already knew that classrooms were too hot initially. And students were falling asleep then, too, because it was too warm and it was uncomfortable for them, and they didn't know how to cope with it. They would complain about sweating, and eventually they would just fall asleep. We found that in the morning classes, to keep the temperature at around 72%, 72, 72 degrees, because it was a little bit warmer, and it hadn't really gotten to the heat of the day. In the afternoon, classrooms should be around 68 degrees, because it's after your athletic events and activities, and lunch. And after lunch, what do you want to do? <laughs> and so if we don't keep it super cold, but we know that the people around you have been working a lot, like there's some science behind the temperatures. Why do restaurants stay so cold? You so you sit down and then do what? Eat and then not fall asleep. Get up and go. Get up and go. Restaurants stay cold, so you eat and leave. And then when you're like, can you tell somebody it's too cold in here? Or will you tell them to turn those fans off? I'll tell the manager, and they make it colder. <laughs> it's, it, there's truly a science behind it. You think I'm kidding. If you work in a restaurant, you know I'm not. Okay, you know I'm not. So that, that's what we do. If we can make you uncomfortable, we know we can make you leave. Your enzymes are the exact same way. They have to have that optimal range in which they can operate. So here is an example of the, just showing you a diagram of the pH. Our enzymes operate... Ideally, at around what pH? Around the neutral pH. We're here between 6 and 8, and we can see a lot of enzyme activity. What happens if it gets too acidic? They denature. They slow down. What if it's too basic? Denatures or slows down. Why do I have this enzyme over here in my body that's able to, to operate ideally at such a low pH? Where is that enzyme? It is in my stomach. Yes, it is in my stomach. This is stomach acid that's used to break down 
with food within your stomach. Your stomach pH is around 2. That's why it's so acidic and breaks down your food. Also, I want to point out that look at the name of the enzyme. It's pepsin. Notice what it doesn't end in. Ace. So I mentioned that most of them do end in ace, but there are a few that don't. So just know. Okay. Here's another example of how enzymes are impacted by temperature. Any type of Himalayan um, has a white fur, and it turns black on the extremities whenever the temperatures are cold. Where's the first part of your body to get cold? Your head, your feet, your fingers, your nose, your ears, which are both you know, on your head. Okay. And if you had a tail, you do have a tail, but it's tucked in warmly, and yours doesn't get cold. But you can see here that these extremities have turned a black color because of the exposure to cold. If I put this animal, same animal, in a warm environment, that black fur will turn white. So these animals, these animals, we, and I could truly take an ice pack and set it on his back, and that area, if I left it there long, like I kept the ice on it for an extended time, like it would have to be three, four, five days, it would start to turn that fur black because it turns a gene on that creates a protein that changes the color. It really does happen. But these animals in Texas tend to stay completely white because they don't really get cold, right? So we're just like, oh, that's an albino or da 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 da. But it's technically a Himalayan because, well, genetically it is. Okay, topic here still on enzymes, it's cofactors. Cofactors um, makes me think of a coworker, and what's a coworker? They, they work with you, like they help you get stuff done. Whatever job you have, your coworker, you're ultimately working towards the end goal together. Cofactors work with enzymes. Okay, so they work for or with enzymes. The umbrella term is cofactor. And there are two types of cofactors, and this becomes slightly confusing, so I want to make sure I explain it. Cofactors is what they're called collectively. If that cofactor is organic, meaning it has carbon, we call it a vitamin. We reference them as coenzymes. So vitamins are coenzymes. Minerals are technically inorganic and referred to as cofactors. So its cofactor is the title. Cofactors are broken down into inorganic, which are called cofactors, and organic, which are called coenzymes. The inorganics are referenced as minerals. The uh, organics are referenced as vitamins. So the fact that cofactors is used twice, it bothers me. But overall, they're called cofactors. They help enzymes. If they are inorganic, we call them minerals. They're cofactors. If they're organic, we call them vitamins. Those are coenzymes. These just function to help enzymes carry out their reactions. Last topic for enzymes. The term, and there's a lot of text here which makes me uncomfortable, but I wanted you to have the definition. The term I'm focusing on here is inhibition or inhibit. What does it mean to inhibit something? The opposite of inhibit would be activate. Inhibit means to stop. So enzyme inhibitors are going to do what? Stop the enzyme. Okay? Enzyme inhibitors are going to prevent the enzyme from carrying out its reaction. There are two types of enzyme inhibitors. Competitive and non-competitive. Competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Here are all the definitions, okay? I want to describe to you what happens because I like to use the diagrams. Here's my enzyme. My enzyme has a specific shape, so when this substrate shows up, it fits in and it does its job. This is what I expect to happen, okay? This enzyme is functioning correctly. Let's say that I want this enzyme to shut down. I want to inhibit it. There are two ways to inhibit an enzyme. 
I can use competitive inhibition, which means I use some type of chemical or molecule that will fit inside that active site and not stimulate activity, but when this substrate shows up, what can it not do? It cannot bind. So it cannot carry out that reaction. Give you an example. You're experiencing pain somewhere in your body. What do you normally do? You take some type of pain medicine, whether it's Tylenol, leave. We're not talking about opioids or drugs right now, okay? Just something small. What those are supposed to do, so here is the chemical, the transmitter that's saying you need to feel pain. A competitive inhibitor would be something like your Tylenol or Aleve. It shows up. Is it the exact same shape? No. But it's close enough that it fits and it stays there. So when your pain molecules show up, guess what you can't process? The pain. You don't feel it. But that's only temporary because eventually your cell is going to clear it out and you're going to have to do what? Hopefully it goes away, but if it continues, then you'll have to take more pain medication. Competitive inhibition means that I am going to actually block the active site you're trying to reach. I'm going to block the active site. So in this example, say uh, Melissa is doing an interview for a position, and both Andrea and I are candidates for this position. We're both great candidates, and we both applied, and we both really, really want this job. But we, get, we both get interviewed, and I'm like, hey, I'm not really feeling confident about it. So I go talk to Mel, and I say, hey, I know that you interviewed both Andrea and I, let me just tell you, Andrea, she never turns anything in on time. She can never make a deadline. A lot of times she's late to work. Like, I'm, she's a great girl, but you probably shouldn't hire her. That's competitive inhibition. We're both competing for the exact same thing, and I'm preventing her from getting there. Okay? Non-competitive inhibition, we don't compete for the same active site. We're not going for the same thing. Somehow or another, I'm blocking you from reaching your goal, but I'm binding somewhere other than the active site. So in competitive inhibition, I bind to the active site. In non-competitive inhibition, I bind somewhere else. The word for somewhere else is allosteric. Allosteric means it's somewhere other than the active site. Allosteric means it's somewhere other than the active site. somewhere other than the active site. Example of this. Same situation. We've both interviewed. We're both excited. We both really want this position. But Abby shows up, and she's good friends with Mel, and she says, hey, I know you interviewed Andrea and Jessica, and they both applied for this job. But I know Jessica personally, and I don't think she would be a good fit for this. Was Abby applying for that same job? She was not competing with me. Andrea was competing with me. She non-competitively inhibited me. She didn't gain anything from it. She did it just because she thought I wasn't a good candidate for that job. So she wasn't actually competing for that active site. She did it somewhere else, allosterically. So non-competitive inhibition. This is what I want to happen. I want it to fit. Competitive inhibition means I put some type of inhibitor on the active site. If it's non-competitive, the inhibitor binds somewhere other than the active site. And that we reference as allosteric. So allosteric means it binds somewhere other than the active site. When we say allosteric, again, allosteric means it binds somewhere other than the active site. We just talked about inhibitors, so you're familiar with that. But what's the opposite of inhibiting something? Activating it. So we could also have allosteric activators. We could also have allosteric activators. And what would their job be to do? To activate an enzyme by binding 
somewhere, uh, yeah, somewhere other than the active site, yes. To activate that enzyme by binding somewhere other than the active site, yes. This is what happens to you whenever you eat lactose. You have lactase if you're not lactose intolerant. If you're, if you're lactose intolerant, this does not apply to you. But you have lactase hanging out in your gut whenever you eat dairy products that have lactose in them. The lactase only works on lactose. So if there's no lactose in you right now, it's just shut down. It's just waiting. When lactose sh shows up, it will bind allosterically to activate, and then it will begin to, the, all that lactase will turn on, and all that lactose will be broken down. What happens after I break down all the lactose? It'll shut back down again, okay? It'll shut back down again. And that's what this diagram is saying here. It's using a different example. It's not using lactose and lactase. But if I've reached the level, this is using therine, which is an amino acid, and therine will be converted in our bodies to isoleucine through a series of reactions. When isoleucine levels are high enough in my body, do I need to keep creating more? If I have enough, do I need to create more? No, in anatomy, I always say too much of a good thing is bad. So if I have enough, I need to send a message to shut it down. Is that an activation or inhibition message? If I need to shut it down. Inhibition. What type of feedback is that, negative or positive? Negative feedback. So if I have enough isoleucine, I send a message, a feedback message, and say, hey, will you stop for right now? I'm solid. What happens when my isoleucine levels decrease? I need to send a message that says, go ahead and activate, I need some more. Okay? Inhibition is shutting down. Yes, ma'am. Okay, this last slide is not in the eCampus notes, but I do know you're going to need to know it, so I included it. It's talking about ribozymes. Ribozymes is a combination of the word enzymes and ribosome. So ribozymes are enzymes found in ribosomes. And guess what they help make? You can just read that. Ribozymes and ribosomes catalyze the linkage of amino acids in protein synthesis. What are we making? proteins. We're going to come back to that, but ribozymes is an enzyme, and this chapter is on enzymes. So I wanted to make sure to put a plug in there real quick for that. And this is the end of this chapter.